Good evening, dear friends. Thank you for joining me on this Sunday evening in what we call in the Christian community Trinity Tide, that period between the major festival of Pentecost and the coming festival tide of John the Baptizer, that period in which our opening and closing prayer returns to what you might call the basic foundation of our liturgy, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I think those three will appear this evening. Troubled times we live in. We're not ignoring them here, but it is necessary from time to time to return to that oasis of peace within ourselves, to deepen our knowledge and understanding of the spiritual facts that in a way govern our experience as Christians. And that's why I would like to spend the next three Sunday evenings preparing the celebration of the festival time of John, the baptizer, which in the Christian community begins always on the festival day itself, June 24th regardless if that's a Sunday or a weekday, I believe it's on Wednesday this year. And then there are four Sundays with the weekdays included so that we have a long period to deepen our experience of this remarkable figure, John, the baptizer. And someone wrote, did I make a mistake? The baptizer, isn't it the Baptist? Well, yes it is. And I've wandered a little bit off course, perhaps, with this term, the baptizer. I find it more active, more uh, like a verb. The Baptist could also be claimed by a particular denomination. I don't know if they do that. I call him John the Baptizer, a name which means gift of God. Johannes in German and many other languages. Ioannes in Greek. And this name is named in the act of consecration of man in the Greek form. We'll talk about that in another time. Yohanan in Hebrew, gift of God. So this festival time adds a great period of time and a long breath. So we can breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out. John, Ioannis, the baptizer. These Sunday evenings we can get acquainted or perhaps reacquainted with John. And my intention would be not so much to delve into the past, although we will do that, but also to bring the qualities of John, also of his lineage, to the present time and hope that we might be able to experience something, something of that in our own lives, to wonder how does John live with us, in us, around us, today. So let's just get grounded, feet on the floor, feel the chair you're sitting on or the earth you're walking down. And just imagine there are people perhaps all over the world listening right now, thinking the same thoughts, imagining this same being. And let's invite the spiritual entity of John to be with us in whatever form he might be alive today. That John may teach us, may inspire us, may fill us with his wisdom and his experience as the forerunner of the Christ. Most of what I'm going to say this evening you'll be able to find in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Now Luke 
is probably has the, a great deal of very unique passages. All of the gospel writers have that. Matthew, Mark, John have passages, stories, pictures, people who are unique to their gospel. The first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke and part of the third are unique to this particular writer. He begins by saying he's going to put everything that has happened and that has been witnessed about the Christ into the proper order so that the friend of God, Theophilus, will be able to understand, to penetrate, to take it in to his thinking being. And we see here already a step into a new age, a new age in which human beings not only in a way dreamily take in what has happened, but begin to work on it, to digest it in a new way so that it becomes awake in their being and becomes an active part of their life. And so Luke begins by setting the stage and telling us in the time of Herodas, who was ruling Israel at that point, there was a priest, Zacharias. Right away we have attention. A king, probably a false king set in by the Romans, and a priest, a priest who is a descendant of a long, long lineage of priests. And this particular priest is married to a woman named Elizabeth, one of the daughters of Aaron. Now here also we have the priestly lineage. A woman in those days could not become a priest, but it's notice, notice, uh, noticeable that she is of this lineage. So we have in these two human beings already an intense connection to the priestly line. to the priestly work, to the liturgy, to the life of prayer and devotion. And we hear that they led a blameless life. But one thing was missing, a child. Luke notes that Elizabeth was barren. I've always wondered how he knew that. It could have been Zacharias. We'll leave that for another discussion. But they had no children. And this was, in those days, something very difficult, something very unpleasant to experience because every Hebrew family hoped that they would bring forth the son who would then become the Messiah. And a certain part of their, you might say, their duty remains unfulfilled. However blameless, flawless, brave, devoted they might be, this one aspect of their life remains unfulfilled. We might say Luke sets the stage and brings the father aspect. Everything that is, all that has become out of the past, what exists, the foundation we stand on. And then we hear that Zechariah, with his group, his cohort, was on duty in the temple. His group of priests had their turn to bring the prayers and the offerings. And on the day that we're talking about, it falls to him by lot to serve at the altar of incense. Now the incense, the, the offering of incense was brought at daybreak and at sundown. We don't know, was it morning or evening? We only know that he was to enter the holy part of the temple and would offer incense. We move then from the realm of the Father to the realm of the Son, that being who moves things, who lives, who creates. Now, what does it mean to burn incense? I have here a little piece of frankincense. I don't know if you can see it. It's a pretty big chunk, actually. This is frankincense taken from the plant, the sap or the heart that has exited the plant and become hard in the air, in the sunlight. It is then harvested and chopped up into little chunks and sold so that 
people like us can use it to burn. And I have a charcoal here, which is almost, yes, it's glowing. And what happens is that we go from the solid form, that which has become, we might say again, a manifestation of the father qualities. And when we lay a piece of, and I'll do that in a minute, when we lay this piece of frankincense on the glowing charcoal, first of all, it becomes liquid. It melts and what is hard becomes liquid. And then it becomes gaseous and then it rises into the air in the form of smoke. So we have with the burning of incense all four elements, the classic elements identified by the Greeks, used by doctors and other wise people through the ages, earth, fire, water, air. We might say the sun moves us into the realm of the spirit and the spirit moves us into the realm of the invisible. Rudolf Steiner said to the people who were hoping to become priests in the fall of 1921, that in the service that was slowly coming into being at that point, the gospel reading would bring the life of Christ into the earth. We would hear the gospel, perhaps a sermon, and then with the offertory, and when we place the incense on the burning coal, the prayers of the people would rise up. The smoke, uh, the word, excuse me, would be embedded in the smoke, entrusted to the smoke, and the word of our prayers can then rise upward and be carried into the realm of spirit. We might say there are many helping spirits, we might call them elemental beings, who carry the word for us. Again, we have an object from the past, something that has become, and I don't know if you, I hope you can see this. We lay it on the charcoal, whoops, we lay it on the charcoal, on the glowing charcoal. I'm not sure it's going to cooperate here. pretty hot. It becomes liquid and you see the smoke rising. So it becomes from what is hard, it liquefies, turns into gas and rises. And you can't see that up there, but as the smoke dissipates into the air, it disappears. It spreads out in the space and whatever words we might speak into the smoke are carried into the heights, into the world of spirit. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's bubbling and liquefying. It's quite fascinating. If you're able to do this, you can get these charcoals at the sort of stores that sell crystals and beads and things like that. And you can get frankincense in chunks. So it was Zechariah's turn to offer the incense. Now, from what I've understood back in the day, the altar of incense was quite large, perhaps as large as my dining room here where I'm sitting. The incense bowl would have been perhaps as large as no, perhaps two or three feet across in diameter and there would have been a lot of charcoal glowing not just one little piece like we do now but a large bowl full of glowing charcoal that would have been set there by a servant and Zechariah would have then strewn many of these little corals of um, incense. Could have been different plants, we don't know exactly what it was. And as he places the incense on the charcoals, the smoke rises, the people in the outer temple are there saying their prayers. They are offering up 
their intentions to the higher world, to the unspeakable Yahweh. And Zechariah lays the incense on the glowing charcoals, representing all of the people who are out there praying. And as the smoke rises, Zechariah becomes aware that an angelic being is present on the right side of the altar. And this being begins to speak. Zechariah, your prayers have been answered. And Zechariah is troubled. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, this could be trivialized, this moment in time, and say, oh, how lovely. These old people get a son. But it's not that way. Again, we see something coming from the past, laying all of its qualities on the altar of God and allowing what is living and burning in the soul to rise up selflessly. And that a being from the future comes into this constellation. This is what is meant. Your prayer has been heard. Not a personal prayer for their own child, but a prayer that the future might manifest itself on the earth. This prayer has been heard. And the angel goes on to describe this being that is to come. And these are some of the few facts that we actually know about John are taken from this message from the angel, which contains, interestingly, interestingly enough, many references to passages in the Old Testament. We hear that many will be glad and rejoice about this birth, that this being will be great before the Lord, that he shall drink no wine nor any strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Excuse me. No wine, no strong drink, a reference to the fact that he will enter the Nazarene order that he will enter into this very strict, stern spiritual schooling. We'll hear more about that in the next contribution next week. He will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Again, something very typical for the prophets that always popped up among the Hebrew people. Again and again and again, they would wander off their given path and again and again, someone would come and call them back. But not only that, he will go before the Lord, their God, in the spirit and power of Elijah. In here, we have a very important reference to the lineage of this John, this Yohanan, that in his past, the being of Elijah has played a very important part. Again, something we'll come to in the next contributions. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the Lord on high. Again, a strange turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. You would think he would say, children, listen to your fathers. No. Turn the hearts of those who come from the past to those beings who will carry the future. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John has the task, or this being who's coming, the task to prepare the people, to get them ready for the coming of another being. We might assume that's the Messiah. Now, Zechariah is, although he is a highly trained and highly experienced spiritual leader, is troubled and surprised, maybe shocked at this appearance, and says, how shall I know this? 
I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And then the angel reveals its identity. I am the angel Gabriel who stands before the Lord. I was sent to you to bring you this good tiding, and now you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when all of this is fulfilled. Now this has often been interpreted as a punishment. That, my dear friends, is nonsense. This is not the intention of the Archangel Gabriel to punish Zechariah for asking a legitimate question. How shall I know this? How shall I understand? How, how am I to penetrate this event with my thoughts, with my prayers, with my meditations? The angel actually gives him a blessing, I would say. Be silent. Take the word you have heard within. Take it into your heart. Allow it to move in your inner meditations, in your thoughts, in your further questions. And so the word spoken to Zechariah by the Archangel Gabriel goes within and becomes a powerful part of Zechariah's own being, of his prayers, his thoughts, his meditations. No word is spoken by his mouth in the outer realm. The word turns within and becomes ever more a part of his being. Now the people waiting outside are waiting and waiting. And finally, Zechariah comes out. He indicates by some gesture that he cannot speak, but the people see in his countenance that he has received a vision, apparently something not terribly unusual in those days, that the priest would be in the, in the inner sanctum and would receive messages, visions, revelations. Now, Zechariah is not able to pass the revelation on in spoken words. We hear that the time of his service ends, he returns home. And after these days, his wife conceives, and she holds herself back. She remains, we would say, in her home for five months. She does speak. Her words are recorded. Thus the Lord has done to me in the days when he looked upon me to take away the reproach among my fellow human beings. This is up till verse 25 in the first chapter of Luke. I'm going to stop here and continue next week. We're going to see that the Gospel of Luke swings back and forth between this initial story of the lineage of John and his conception, the Annunciation. It will go to another Annunciation, which we're not going to talk about. Then it will come back to the story of John's birth and the giving of his name. And then we'll continue on with what's known about his life story and his mission. I wish you a pleasant evening. If you're interested, please look in your Bible, Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. You can review what we've heard this evening and prepare yourself for what is to come. Thank you, in the spirit of John the Baptizer. Good evening.